Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be the first one talking in Grand Rounds for this academic year and the first one being presenting on M&M for this academic year. <laughs> so it's a dual honor today. <laughs> well, uh, so we decided to talk a little bit about fail anastomosis, and I understand this is a very wide topic and involves many, many things. I'm going to try to synthesize it to the best of my ability and have the residents take home some points of what to do and what to look for when this happens, because this happens to all of us uh, in one way or the other if you do enough anastomosis. So we're going to go over what the definition is, and that might be more complicated than we might think. Uh, the biology of healing, what risk factors have been described, not necessarily proved, but you will want to find them in the literature, how to diagnose this, treat them, and what's new out there to treat or maybe prevent anastomotic uh, leaks. So some of the facts are that leaks happen, and be aware of the surgeons that say they have a 0% leak rate. It's probably they're not seeing their own leaks. They're going somewhere else. So anywhere from 1% to 30%, depending on what type of anastomosis and who you read and under what, which circumstances. Um, we know that left-sided colonic leaks are more common than right-sided anastomosis. Um, at least in most of the colon, I not, not, no, don't know if necessarily true for mid-rectal anastomosis, a staples usually equals hands-on anastomosis when done properly. And the only thing that is for sure, if, the, if you do an anastomosis under tension, and, or you think it has poor supply, or both, it'll be trouble for sure. One way or the other, it might not be manifesting as an acute leak, but it's gonna come back as stricture, stenosis, or poor function down the road. And this is important because leaks have been associated with significant morbidity and mortality. If you are dealing with patients with rectal cancer, you increase, increase the recurrence of the rectal cancer in these patients, and in this already compromised subset of the population, give them a worse a function, which is something we care deeply about in patients who undergo surgery for rectal cancer. One more thing, if you have a leak and you have a marginal insurance coverage, you're going to go bankrupt for sure, because this is hundreds of thousands of dollars that will be, a, you'll be responsible for, uh, probably multiple hospital stays and the significant stress that that represents for families who have gone through this. So, in a brighter note, we have come a long way from the 1700s and 1800s. Um, people were doing anastomosis, believe it or not, before 1882, when some things changed. And if you see this line up here, this is the mortality, not the leak rate. So you can see that probably those went hand in hand. Infection had a lot to do with that. But it was almost 100% in some years of mortality. You got a, these are like six or seven cases that were reported by them at some point, and they're being gathered by uh, Dr. Deeds and put in this, this nice paper. And uh, we're not anywhere there. A lot of things have changed, but it took a while to get where we are now. And it's always been puzzling to me, how do you go from this when you leave the operating room what looks like a perfectly nice, healthy piece of colon going down to the pelvis, no tension to this five days after. Uh, not, I would like to think not every surgeon leaves the operating room thinking that, yes, there's some tension or maybe the blood flow will increase. We all leave the room thinking we did a great anastomosis. And even though we think that, this happens five, seven, 10, 15 days later after, after we, we leave the, we, we, you know, even the patients might not be even in the hospital at this point. So with this, walking into what the definition of anastomotic leaks would be, um, this uh, Dr. Bruce and his team decided to undertake the easy task of defining it. And they realized that there were many papers, but no one really talked about what it was. And, um, well, it wasn't that easy. These are all the definitions they found, just with the colorectal leaks, how they manage, and it's not intent for you to see every number, just to see how many of this subset of papers tried to define it and no one could come to an agreement. 
And this is without counting pouches, which is this much of other papers. So they realized that their difference between definitions make it almost impossible to compare leak rates between institutions because not well defined. And they also thought like, huh, the Pankers guys already have all this ahead of us, why can't we do it? Um, so this group met in 2010 and then met again recently to propose a leak rate after colorectal anastomosis and mainly after rectal cancer surgery which applies to most of col colonic or colorectal anastomosis in the definition. And they went in Medline, find 1,900 papers for the past few years. Only 59 said what a leak was. So that's dismal compared to what they all should say. And no one graded it, saying that it didn't matter if you leak, you got augmenting and went home, or you leak and you got a colostomy and stay in the hospital for four weeks. Uh, the diagnosis you know, tools they use for clinical exams, you know, you respect to. Hey, CAT scans, enemas, or endoscopy, they will all confirm 100% with laparotomy if they needed it. And the need for the kind of interventions they use to stratify the gradient of the leak. And they came with this definition, which I think is pretty good. is any defect in the, in the wall that communicates the lumen with the outside of the lumen. And things like a pelvic abscess actually should be considered a leak if they're next to the anastomosis. So that gives a platform to go outside the box and actually say, yes, it has an abscess, but it's not because it were bacterial transposition. This is a leak we had. It might be a low-grade leak, and we can do it without catheter, but still a leak that should be counted. So, and the grading was based on what you needed to do. Grade A, you know, antibiotics, bowel rest, maybe some TPM, you go home. To grade C, you need a, a laparotomy, and everything in between could be any endoscopic or percutaneous intervention that do not require you to take the patient to the operating room. This has been out there for seven years now, and it's still barely mentioned in any paper that deals with DIG, because we don't like to think our patients leak when we present our results. So moving forward is how do we heal? And this, this will be brief. Uh, it's a cut of the lumen of a bowel. And these are the layers. And for the residents in the outside, this will be for sure. The strength layer of the bowel is the submucosa. That's where the collagen is. And it's been asked every year for the past probably 15 years at least. And the muscle, and then you get the serosa. And so this is key for healing long term. The serosa is key for the early phases of healing because it seals your initial step of the anastomosis with your sutures. It won't hold your anastomosis if the, so if the submucosa has a poor, or you did a poor anastomotic technique and didn't incorporate what you need to incorporate, but at least the first 24 hours, the patients will be fine, 40, 44 hours, 48 hours. That's why most people do not, you don't see leaks at 48 hours or 24 hours after surgery unless you left a gaping hole before you leave in the room. So this is how we heal. So same for bowel. You go through an inflammation phase that translated after into proliferation, which means collagen synthesis. And then remodeling, which goes from collagen 3 to type 1. And the cells involved at the beginning are like platelets to form the plug, moving into neutrophils and macrophages, and ended up with a fibroblast, which are the final factors of healing of the anastomosis. And there's curves intersect here, and this is what ends up happening, is you have a healing curve up here, and then where this synthesis and degradation of collagen crosses, around day four to six, more or less, is like the weakest point of your anastomosis. So normally people who leak within the first five days, they're still in-house, they're also sicker than people that leaks two or three weeks down the road. These are the ones that you take with free air and stool coming out of the midline wound, not the subclinical leaks you see down the road. And these are the risk factors reported. There's a lot of debate if these are true or not. Some of them we can modify, some of them we can't modify. It. Um, we can try to improve certain things like nutrition or having the patients, if you have time enough to tell them, to stop smoking for X amount of weeks. Um, but you can change their IBD. You can change the fact that they got chemoradiation. 
or they go around biologics. You don't have the luxury on these people to tell them, don't take your steroids, I'm gonna take your infliximab to do your surgery for Crohn's disease. You have to do it and accept the risk. Um, other things like bowel prep has been back and forth. Now we're on the back again, we should do it. And technique is key, how much you know, blood loss and complications are usually surrogates of complications of the case and how tough the case was. That's some of the things that bias as well, reporting of laparoscopic versus open. Uh, looking into that, uh, Jeff Milson's group and Dr. Michelassi's group from Cornell and other people, you try to see what happened with 600 of their patients and which risk factors they could find. And there's a number of papers reporting this. So they got a pretty even group of people. Uh, probably this doesn't translate into what we see here, but probably New York and California, where most of the patients came from. And very busy table here, but they look everything from gender to where did you tie your pedicles in. And if you got anastomosis, called colonic, called rectal type, staple, hands-on, all these factors. So they were very broad in their selection criteria. These are all their patients. And skipping the univariate analysis uh, and jumping right into the multivariable model, they realized that they, these were the things that were significant in univariate that they included. And for some reason, neoadjuvant therapy for them wasn't. So I'm not exactly sure if this means just chemo, chemo radiation, or both. Um, but sex comes times after time, this is, usually it's males, and the reason is narrow pelvises and fatty pelvises in males make the surgery tougher. I don't think it has anything to do uh, with gender per se. Charleston comorbidity index, that's going to be now part of our new M&M &M model. If you have more than three of those, you're sicker, probably have a higher risk of leaking. Anything less than 10 centimeters, and I would say it's really less below the peritoneal reflection is a problem. You know, some people have the peritoneal reflection at five centimeters, some people have it at 12 centimeters. So it's, it's anatomically variant. And uh, where do you take the IMA? We know that if you take the IMA at the root of the aorta or one centimeter after the takeoff, some people decrease the pressure to the marginal to 40 millimeters of mercury, which is almost the minimal you need to heal something. Um, if there were intraoperative complications, a surrogate of complicated cases. Um, they, their leak rate in this paper was 5% in all commerce, which is pretty decent. Uh, looking more after uh, other risk factors, this is a NISQIP numbers that the Dr. Paquette uh, presented, and they, they compare open laparoscopically and right colons, uh, segmental resection, so the laparoscopic had less risk least rate that open, I think it's completely biased. We're not looking at complicated cases. Not many people go straight into an open right colon in a healthy patient with a BMI of 20. Uh, it's probably selection criteria here, but nonetheless, this is what they found. And in the multivariable analysis, the same culprits appear, MELSEX, disregard the open or laparoscopic approach. If you have a long operative time, if you got chemo before and so on and so forth. Uh, doing a lipiliostomy, they think, protected the leak rate. This is probably related that NISQIP tracks your outcomes within 30 days, and some people might have left and gone to another institution, so we don't know exactly what happened with them. But it's been proven that doing an ileostomy per se won't decrease the chance of leaking. It will decrease your chance of getting very ill from a leak, which is a little different. And in terms of frequencies, uh, this just mostly summarizes. You can see the anterior resections, anterior resections with colonic pouches and colostomy closures, and these kind of like low pelvic anastomosis techniques are the ones that most people report and having significant in higher risk, risk of anastomotic leaks. But you know, there's nothing we can do. Uh, we just have to be vigilant for who is male patients with challenging anatomy, or if they got radiation, you should probably be diverting these patients, uh, especially pelvic radiation. Uh, low albumin, if you have to take the pedicle centrally or as a combination of these factors, it's probably a good practice, at least at the beginning of your career, to do a loop ileostomy on these patients instead of cowboying and pay the price of your patients. So what about the timing of leaks? You know, four days, six days? So it changes, and uh, Leo Feo, when he was at, uh, in Michigan, they, they wrote this paper looking at their experience, and um, 
they compare laparoscopic versus open when the paper presented. And it's, most papers repeat this, that it's not really day four or five. Some people are, most people I would say come home when the leak because they were doing mostly well during the first, you know, operative days. And now with this fast track enhanced recovery after surgery, we're seeing that more and more people are going home and then coming back sick. Now, if they were perfect to go home, that's a matter of discussion. But so they realized that open and laparoscopic, there were no statistically significant difference in either leak rate or the timing when they presented. Slide it earlier during laparoscopic and they mentioned in their paper that maybe a less inflammatory reaction from laparoscopy would make you present earlier to some extent. And um, what is true is that if you got a leak, the next three to four weeks of your life are going to be spent in a hospital bed uh, trying to get better. And that was no different from, from the two of them. Uh, I, I like this paper a lot. I think it's a very honest paper when Neil Hyman was in Vermont. And the surgeons in this group are Neil Hyman and um, Peter Cataldo. They were the two main surgeons that they, and they actually published their outcomes, named surgeon one and surgeon two. They didn't disclose who was who, and I have no idea. But looking at the leak rate, comparing the leak rate over a period of time, saying this is what happened to us, and you see that one surgeon has more leak than the other, and they were okay with publishing that. They had no problems. Uh, and most of the leaks that you will see um, were ileorectal anastomosis, which they describe, or is sometimes thought as a safe surgery, but it's, uh, it's that's one of the surgeries I fear the most because the people leak a lot and they have a lot of complications from ileorectal surgery. And um, uh, they, they well, Dr. Hyman was at some point an invited professor at the New England Colorectal Society meeting, and he was telling us that they have no idea why it happened. They have changed their configuration of your rectals to multiple different things, but they still were having troubles with it, so more than the, the rest of procedures. And what I think is key about this paper is that this is a graph on what people presented, and you'll see that 49% of people leak within eight days. And that's what the paper is called, it's later than you think. And some of them we might have catch in the hospital because they were never doing good. The patients that are like, they have an ileus on day three that you can't explain, and they don't progress, and they start vomiting. This is the kind of people that usually leak. It's not the guys that are flying and eating a cheeseburger day two. Yes, it can happen, but it doesn't really happen like that most of the time. And what's important is here, this is a group of people that you send home thinking they will be better at home eating home food and then they come back with an anastomotic leak. And that's the other 51% of people. So you have people leaking up day 38, 37, you know, a bunch of people doing it between like 18, 17. So be vigilant. These patients, I mean, they, you need to be aware that risks don't disappear when they leave the hospital doors. You know, be receptive to their phone calls and always be wondering what's going on when they show up in the emergency room with some complaint they shouldn't have on day eight or 12 or 15. Uh, what about diverting people? The Leahy group uh, wrote this paper about do they leak or they don't leak. Uh, you can actually see that these are high risk patients. You can compare this with your traditional elective sigmoid diverticulitis. And, and they did 245 anastomosis during this period of time in this that they were diverted. And the leak rate was 14%. That's probably significantly higher than we were all report or has been reported out there. And they had leaks coming up, they 43 pulls up. So it, it, once you divert them, the whole thing changes. And just because they don't get that sick and you don't see that, and only 5% of these people were diagnosed within five days. The other will pick up either by a gastrographic enema or endoscopic study or both before reversing the loop ileostomy. So be very mindful that, you know, ileostomies can be of age. I don't know how many of these people who have gotten really ill and end up with an end colostomy for life had they not been diverted at the right time. So talking about this, so yes, diversion is an option, but it's not a, you know, get a free car, you know, jail car with no consequences. So ask your patient and ask yourself, what is the risk of an anastomosis and depending on where it is, if you have anastomosis, can this patient tolerate it? Can we have seen that sometimes it's better to put the patients together and leave a loop ileostomy than 
do someone to have an ankylostomy for life because you're not going to be able to reverse it six months or a year after because the rectal stump is sunk in the pelvis. So it, it, they might do well with a drain and nutrition and antibiotics for some time instead of having an end stoma. I would take my chances, I tell you that. And what are the patient wishes? Do they understand what a, a stoma means? Can they handle that? All those things are key. And I mention this because this is a problem that we have here, and hopefully we're going to work on this. Ileostomies have problems. 40% of these people are going to come back to your doors dehydrated or with some kind of issue. And this has been proven in paper after paper, and they all come back. Even if minor things that we think are not important, like peristomal dermatitis or pain or parastomal hernias, are very important for patients because they cannot keep themselves clean. They cannot put an attachment on. They cannot handle their stoma. They have issues of you know, body image when they have one, and these things are important to our patients. So be mindful when you do it, and you know, if you do it, try to get it back and revert it as soon as you can, and it's safe. So leaks happen, so how do we diagnose them? Well, clinical signs, these are the easy ones. Abdominal pain, fever, tachycardia, peritoneal signs, stool coming out through your midline wound. You, you know, go to the operating room, so take care of that. Those are the easy ones. So you have the clinical signs and, you know, subtle signs, and you get a CAT scan. Don't give them oral contrast if you're looking for a mid-rectal anastomosis. It's not going to get anywhere. It's going to be a waste of time. Patients are going to puke, aspirate, and die of aspiration. So rectal contrast, endoscopy, something else. But do not give, do get a useless test for a patient with a colonic anastomosis. So almost always rectal contrast is needed. And this might imply the resident coming down with the patient, putting the catheter, and injecting the contrast. Because the techs might not know, and then if you didn't have a leak, you're probably going to have a catheter in the pelvis and a leak now. So it's not ideal, but this is something we need to do if we want it to be well done. CAT scan diagnosis. What about biochemical tests? And this has been a around for at least 15 years. And some of these are described, some of them I use, some of them I have never used, or you know, they're not in the adoptive phase now. So it's CRP, procalcitonin, which both are being used in critical care for different things uh, to assess you know, how sick people are and respond to sepsis and all that. Pertin uh, cytokines, measuring that in the plasma or in the, or in the, in the drain fluid, and all these Krebs cycle things that we'll, we'll talk briefly. So C-reactive protein, the protein, so CRP, is non-specific, but it's, everyone has it. Um, it has a very short half-life, and if something bad happens, or the initial injury from the surgery, it should regress fairly quick to almost normal values or to within a range. If it doesn't happen, something's going on, unless you're on statins and other things that can blunt your inflammatory reaction and uh, uh, skew your results. So, and you measure it, and it's been tested when to measure it. So day three, if you have one more than th 135, plus or you know, minus a few points, depending on your lab, we know that you know, sensitivity and specificity is in the 70% for all these tests. I think what's key is the negative predictive value. In all these tests, is over 95%, which if someone has you know, a negative CRP, the chances of them having a major leak is not that high, and this has been proven time and time again. CRP on day one, you can see that the values of the area under the curve are not great, but then as you hit day three and come down, it's, it's pretty good. So if you get someone a CRP because they're not doing well on day five, and it's 600, they probably have a leak. It should be 20. Um, and the value of this for me, and I'll go about you know a couple more papers, is that not in the patient who's doing perfect. is a patient that you would normally not image day three because we tend not to scan people on day three because they have an ileus and they're not flying. You get a CRP and it's not what it's supposed to be. Maybe you should accelerate your workup on these patients to try to intervene early, drain the pelvic sepsis and, you know, so go on and so forth. They compare procalcitonin with CRP. Um, and it's pretty much the same. So procalcitonin have a similar uh, negative predictor value. I'm not sure how widely available that is in, at least here, I have never used it. Uh, but there's been multiple papers looking into alpha colorectal surgery. And it's been proven as well that 
if your levels are off where they're supposed to be in a receiver operator curve, depending on the day you're checking, there might be something going on. The same applies for this instead of CRP to when, to what to do with the patient. So you have to put clinical scenario with the test. If the patient is perfectly fine and this is off, you know, it probably should go with the patient, not with the test. But it's an aid in diagnosing some of these things early. This is comparing the uh, procalcitonin CRP and white blood cell count. You can see that white blood cell count is completely unreliable compared to all these measures when you're looking at how things are going. What about peritoneal cytokines? And they put a drain, you aspirate and send them an A1, and you look at IL-6, A10, TNF, all these things. 8.3% leak rate in the paper, which is, uh, you know, is fairly good, I, I would say, for colorectal, low colorectal anastomosis. They, they, the other authors of the same were not impressed and say, this is fair, we don't have it yet. So I'm not sure we're in the adoption phase in this time with the paper, at least. What about if we leave a microdialysis catheter with a portable um, recording device to measure the you know, Krebs cycles things, uh, lactate, glucose, lactate, pyruvate ratio, ratio. And in the lab, it looks great. It implies leaving a catheter that you would not leave, and the technology is not widely available. Uh, they're not exactly sure what to do with the numbers. They're looking into this. Is it evolving? So they themselves says this is not ready for prime time yet, but it might be in the near future, or it might never be. But at least someone is looking into that. So... <laughs> So we diagnose our patient for whatever means you want, and what do we do with that? With them? So it all depends on these factors, and when did you operate on them, when the anastomosis is, how much of the anastomosis fell apart, is you know how old are they, how sick are they? So everything is patient-centered. So you can be from no operative management to emergency surgery and a colostomy, going through IR or endoscopic interventions or whatnot. When they're sick, this is the only thing you need to do. You need to operate on them wash them out. If you need to take down the anastomosis, you do that, do a colostomy, and, you know, it's, it happens. Um, but what about if they're not that sick or you want to do something different? So these, um, these guys, and you can omit the laparoscopic part of it because this applies to laparoscopy or no laparoscopy. They look into this. It's just fresh out of press. Uh, all these patients were rectal cancer and how they did it. They had a leak rate of 7.8%, so in line with most colorectal anastomosis out there. Um, and this is what they proposed, and I thought this, this was very clever. So if you have ileostomy or you don't have ileostomy, things will change. So if you have an ileostomy and you have a pelvic abscess, you drain it or you drain it transanally, depending on the level of the anastomosis. But if you have an ileostomy and you're dying of sepsis, it doesn't matter. Maybe your whole conduit died. You need to go to the operating room and get a colostomy. What about the people who have no sepsis and they do fine and they just have a two centimeter abscess? You might get away with just keeping them diverted, giving them the antibiotics, uh, and go from there. That's not that common in colorectal surgery, but it can happen. If you have no ileostomy, there you pretty much are going to need to go to the operating room for some kind of procedure. So if it's severe, you operate on them and you take down the anastomosis. If it's just fall apart or the whole conduit is dead, then do a colostomy. And if that is not the case, you might just go laparoscopically, depending on your abilities and what time of the day, you know, day of the week it is, wash them out and do a loop ileostomy, or go in open, wash them out and do a loop ileostomy. I don't think the technique is important. The important is controlling the sepsis on these patients and diverting them to somehow. The results were good, and that worked for them. Uh, I think it's a good starting point, and then you reassess and see what you have. So this has been what's traditional, but you know, thinking outside the box and thinking, what else can we do for these people? So what about endosponge? It's been talked about in upper GI uh, leaks, and there was an initial attempt to do this for colorectal patients, and it came off the market for some reason. Now, it came off the market in the United States. It did not come off the market in Europe, which is usually how things go most of the time. They look around all the papers that review this. It's, this is people who are not dying of a leak. These are people who are, you might have to drain them or they don't have a loop ileostomy, put one. But if you can avoid taking down the anastomosis, that would be ideal. 
and this is how it looks. You go in endoscopically or you do an endoscopic ultrasound, you find the cavity. This has to be ideally a fresh leak because if you have a stiff, non-compliant cavity, it doesn't matter how much suction you're gonna put in there, it's not gonna regress, it's not gonna get better. So do it early uh, if you can, put the sponge, and the results are being great, over 80% healing without taking down a low colorectal anastomosis. This is what's been published. And you can see that uh, in these multiple papers. Now, these are series of small people because, first, this is not that common in every service. To have 10 rectal leaks, I hope you have to go at least a year or more to have that and, and over 100 patients with, color, with rectal cancer, which is, you know, doing 100 rectal cancers a year, that's a significant number for any center, and then have them 10 leak, that's probably not good, or one leak or eight leaks. So that takes, it's gonna take a long time. And the other thing I wanna tell you is that then, even though you probably have salvage anastomosis, usually something's gonna happen down the road if you leak from a rectal, low rectal anastomosis. That it impairs function and stenosis is gonna be a de big deal, but we can always balloon dilate these patients and most of them are salvable and would rather have a salvage anastomosis and an end stoma for life unless their function is terrible because it was associated to radiation and all that stuff. And they usually will come and beg you for a colostomy. And, and then we're all in the same page, but you don't force them to have one, at least at the beginning. Stents, we borrow this as well from the, uh, our bariatric colleagues with, and esophageal surgeons. Uh, it's been multiple studies about this. There's a problem with stents. If you're dealing with low anastomotic leaks, the patients hate them because they get tenesmus, pain, extend migration, and they can tolerate them. If they're on the higher side, it might be better. You still have probably to divert these people. Um, the stent has to traverse the anastomosis. Now we're putting fibrin glue and clips on the stent so they don't migrate down the lumen. But they will, they can help. The results are, equivocal at best at the moment, and I think it's because we are sub-selecting people. We're not, we can do it in everyone, and it's hard to have them tolerate the, the procedure or the repeated procedures when they migrate and so on and so forth. So this is how it looks. You drain the cavity, put a stent, and if you're gonna do that, I would advise you to either be very good putting this or find someone who is good. It's not just enough to know how to do it. You have to know how to do it well and do a lot to avoid complications and have the better, the better outcome. So, we, you know, a lot of this has been what to do when they leak and who would leak and all that, but is there something we can do to avoid leaks? The short answer is no, but I'm gonna give you what's out there. Um, they came out with this this year. Uh, they published their paper. They can put a, something called C-seal, which is an intraluminal protective device to avoid anastomosis. They used the grading system that they was proposed for rectal cancers, and they took the number of anastomosis, and this is how it looks. You put a, deploy that in the anvil and in your stapler, and you then pull it down, and it's just cut it flush with the anus, and then it will dissolve, and you will pass it. What is the problem? Well, they got more leaks than people who didn't get it. That's one start, which is bad. Uh, number two is um, there, the trial was not standardized. Some people decide to prep their colon. Some people decide not to prep their colon. And what they found is that the people who didn't get their colon prep got a stool bowl just proximal to this bag and blew their anastomosis. So now they're thinking about redoing the test with people having had prep bowel. I think it's gonna take a few years to clear the FDA and get here, so I would not you know, hope for that to be around anytime soon, but it's at least someone is looking into these things. What about staple line reinforcement in colorectal anastomosis? So Dr. Senegar, who was here recently, he was the driving force behind this paper with Steve Wexner and all them in there, and they tried to mimic the results of the upper GI surgery again with a different products to reinforce the staple line. The, um, and I'll go over the results. And the second the, the paper that came that was controlled randomized, like these two are the only ones that I'm aware of for low colorectal anastomosis. Uh, this is a group from Spain. They tried to do the same thing. 
And this is how it looks. It, some, of the, some of the staplers actually come with this. I saw a Covidian stapler with this already attached. Um, they failed to prove it was better for licks. At least the, uh, the North American paper failed to prove this. And they saw a tendency that they could probably be better pro uh, avoiding strictures in the anastomosis. Now, they're not very clear how they find a stricture because the anastomosis will narrow down. And I don't know how many of these people, if they're dilating 8% of their patients without doing this, they're doing something wrong because that shouldn't be a stricture rate for a normal functional anastomosis. So basically, I asked Dr. Senegor when he was here, and they basically discarded this. This was a failed trial, and they were not going to pursue that anymore, at least at this point. Um, the Spaniards found no difference at all, either leaks or in the degree of stenosis of the anastomosis, so they forego the use of this, and they do not recommend using this. What about looking at the blood flow in these patients using either pinpoint or using the SPI system we have with ICG green? And numbers are not great, but they, in this paper, which is a multi-institutional study done here in the United States in multiple centers from New York to California, they, they saw that it helped them in about three cases of their series to change their proximal transection point in descending, ana in descending to rectal anastomosis. Uh, the numbers are not robust, uh, but I think it's an eight in left-sided anastomosis where you only blood flow are from the marginal through the middle columns. It takes probably a minute to do, and you see if it's perfuse or not. Uh, what I've been doing lately, and sometimes the spy is not available or what not you, I tend to dissect the mesentery all the way to the marginal, isolate the marginal, and then cut it with a piece of, with a medicine bound. If it doesn't pump blood, well, it doesn't matter how much the spy tells you it's okay, it's not okay. So you have to go proximal to your transection point and guarantee you have a good anastomosis and well perfused. They, the, the, the results are mixed still, but no adverse effect from using this have been reporting on any patients, and it really doesn't take long. So I think it, it has a future, and especially in this white mobilized patient. I, I don't think it has anything to add in a right colectomy where you see the edge of the mesentery going into the colon and you feel the pulse of these vessels, but maybe for low anteriors and left side resections, it's a, it's a way to go in the future. And what about this? I think I have presented this before. I, sound like a broken record regarding this, you have to test your colon resections. If you're doing left-sided resections, you need to test it. I don't care if it's diverted or it's, uh, you think it's perfect and it's the most beautiful anastomosis you've made in your life, you need to test it or it's almost liable not to do it. Um, this is the Leahy Clinic group and multiple other groups, Dr. Abkarian's in Chicago, and this, this is, and I'm biased so was using flexible endoscopy because rigid proctos are great and you can get air, but I don't think you can see the anastomosis that well unless you are, unless it's very low and you're very good and you're the one doing it. And it, the, so flexible scope takes one minute. It's readily available everywhere. You can get it. If something is bleeding, you can actually target where you're going to go with the bleeding. You can clip it. You can put a suture. You can do something about it. And the insufflation is much better than the handheld devices, as well as the visualization of the entire team, not just the person down there looking at the anastomosis. So here's you just need to call GI with a couple hours in advance, and they'll have a tower for you up there. It's, it has not been a problem for me getting this here. And just to conclude, maybe we're looking at all this, you know, the wrong way. Now, multiple papers have come that says that not necessarily is what you did or how you select your patients or if you prep the bowel or you did not prep the bowel. There's more and more evidence that the microbiome and altering the microbiome of these patients with bowel preps, antibiotics, and being death to the hospitals has something to do with triggering some signals that might increase inflammatory reaction and disbalance the good to bad bacteria ration in the colon and can cause leaks. This has been studied uh, widely and there's no enough evidence to say that it is the problem, but I'm sure that it, this has something to do with leaks and not leaks. It has something to do with everything else. So why would it have it something to do with that? So it'll be a little while before we get 
some definite evidence that this is, or what to do about this, is something to do. So to conclude, leaks happen, and they're likely multifactorial. Early diagnosis and intervention is the key. Drain your sepsis, get your patient well, and be ready for, to fight another fight. Biomarkers, they, they're helpful, um, is used in the right context. There's no gadgets now to prevent leaks except good technique and um, selecting your patients right, something that's been described for the past over 100 years now. Um, there's some potential for tissue perfusion assessments, and it's a must to do your colorectal testings in this kind of anastomosis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dow. Questions for Dr. Dow? Hi, Dr. That was a great talk. Definitely the best talk I've ever heard on this topic. Um, I have a question. The grading system for scoring your leaks seems to me like it incentivizes you to do less because mm. as our results become more publicly available, we're all going to want to avoid grade C leaks. Yeah. And so you may do percutaneous approaches to things when actually an operative approach is indicated just to not say you had a grade C. Do you foresee that as a problem? And do you think there could be some better way of, like, you know, 25% disruption or 50% disruption or leak with sepsis, leak yeah. without sepsis, or some way that's really about the patient's condition? not about the treatment the doctor yeah. chooses. Yeah, I agree with you. And actually, the, I think if this is just left to surgeons, we're going to try to cheat on it to make them see looks B and whatnot. So the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons has a guidelines saying that if you have a more than 30% fallout of your anastomosis, probably your patient belongs to the operating room, and you need to take down that anastomosis and do a stoma on them, regardless of having a loop ileostomy for or not because that's usually the result of a conduit ischemia and not necessarily a staple line failure or, or whatnot. So I, I do think that this has to be put in context with the clinical condition of the patient. Some patients do not even need to be stratified. They're going to be sick and they're leaking. They need to go to the operating room without a gastrographic enema or not. And honesty is important in all these trials. So and we have to be honest with ourselves and be able, be willing to take the hits when we need to and say this was a great C and well, you know, I did all I could for this patient to avoid this to happen, but it happened. But yes, there's uh, some other guidelines saying exactly, transmitting your worries about this. Hi, sir. Great talk. Appreciate it. Um, I have a question for you about the CRP. Um, so with respect to that, uh, we check that on all of our bariatric patients pre-op, mm -hmm. and it's always elevated. Mm -hmm. It's just also one of the inflammatory markers for obesity. So just curious, within San Antonio's population, and if you're using that here, because mm -hmm. um, if it's already elevated kind of going in, your baseline's elevated. So I mean, I can see a trend that it might be higher than it was at its baseline, but um, or are you finding that here when you use it, it's... Is it helpful in this population that basically? Well, I haven't checked it pre-op. I don't think any of the, the papers have report or advised to do that. Um, I don't know how, when you say elevated, what does that mean? I mean, the regular normal values are less than one. It's, it's very small. What's elevated, how high? No, for us, I mean, we see them, they're always elevated, but significantly. Okay. So I, I'm not, for colorectal, I haven't seen that problem. I haven't checked pre-op CRPs. I have to tell you, when people are leaking, it's not subtle. It's not like, it's like 300, 500. That I have seen. So I don't, I'm not sure that how, how, it will be interesting to see what the area under the curve looks when you have elevated baseline CRPs. And that may be something that can be done in obese patients who are on statins, which most of the patients you take probably are on statins. So that should blunt your reaction. But if you're high, even though, pre-op, it might be worthwhile looking, and you do a lot of these cases, so putting this together should not be an issue for you getting, I don't know how many you would need, depending on the instance. To use the CRP in that respect, and I mean, we use it, uh, again, inflammatory, and we just watch it go down, yeah. whether it's a, an improvement in their cardiac, you know, Yeah, yeah, it's cardiac risk-based, yes. That's, that's why we're using yeah. it, so I'm surprised here, because I wouldn't have thought to. There, there are some papers on upper GI surgery where they use CRP, especially esophageal, you know, sleeve gastric anastomosis, all these, they are out there. 
Uh, I, I don't know the data on those. So it will be interesting to see what they found pre-op and what they found now, post -op. Yeah. Which, you know, one, most patients haven't leaked by then anyway, and those that do, as you mentioned, tend to yeah. be pretty full. You know, those are the complete and asthmatic daily early failures, and they're not really a clinical yeah. challenge most of the time. So what sort of a scenario where you found that? So where I was before, I was using it in everyone to get a kind of a baseline and a sense of how things would look when they deviate from the norm. Now we're more selective. I'm almost always using it in people who had, they are diverted with low rectal anastomosis because I might never find out if they're leaking until four weeks after surgery or whatnot. But I think the most value is, and they, these people on day three or four, they should be almost going.